We find ourselves here, at the beginning. Another tale, another chapter. For much of its history to that point, Japan had kept to itself, and it kept the rest of the world out. That all came to an end, along with the end of the Edo period. In the 1850s, the cultures began to mix like never before, and along with merchandise, people traded in stories and folk tales. Tatsuzo loved all the different beasts and monsters the Westerners talked about. He had heard of a Greek collective of kami, all living on a single mountain, and one of these kami created a boar monster called a minotaur. Legends of wolves who were men except on the full moon brought shivers to many a sailor's spine when they talked over drinks in the evenings. Tatsuzo was a greedy man for these tales, and he hoarded them as best he could, and he never missed a chance to tell them to a crowded room. Ataru was Tatsuzo's nephew, who would come to live with Tatsuzo while the boy's father went into the fields to help with the harvest. The child was only eight, but Tatsuzo wasn't his father and never made him go to bed. Instead, with terrified curiosity, Ataru would stay up late into the evenings listening to his uncle tell the stories of the western monsters to a room full of their neighbors in front of a roaring fire. The flicker of the flames made red shadows dance on the walls and ceiling, as Tatsuzo acted out each story for his rapt audience. During that particular evening, Tatsuzo was regaling the crowd with the tale of the kami he called the Morrigan. She's a magnificent black bird who flies over the dead and dying on the battlefields of a country called Ireland. It is said that this bird chooses who shall be slain and gives them terrors in their dreams before battle, he said. The audience all sucked in a collective breath at Tatsuzo's words, and Atara hid his face behind his hands, hoping the flickering images on the wall would go away. Just as his uncle invoked the Nightmare Queen's name, Atara swore he saw a figure of gigantic crow cawing in the shadow of one log on the fire. The wind blew fiercely that night around their home, swirling and making the tree branches outside to scratch and claw on the sides of the house. One neighbor asked for something to drink, and Tatsuzo stopped his story for just long enough to make Ataru go out to the well and get more water for some fresh tea. It was already full dark outside, but Ataru, scared as he was, obeyed. He slid open the door and slipped out and off the wood porch. The ground was soft and mossy, so close to the ancient forest of Jukai. Tatsuzo's house was one in a close-knit collective, of three other houses along a small dirt road. Outside the laughing and jovial sounds coming from the house, the area was utterly silent. There weren't even the sounds of the trees scratching on the building anymore. Atara wasted no time in getting to the well. Moving as quickly as he could, the boy pulled hard on the thick rope attached to the bucket at the bottom of the hole. It felt heavier than the well he usually used, but that one was on the side of the house nearest the forest and he couldn't bring himself to venture too close to his edge tonight, not with the Morrigan's shadow about. Finally, the rope ended in a large knot tied to the top of the bucket. It sloshed, full of water, and Atara poured it into the pail he had brought with him. When something rattled and splashed onto the ground, Atara looked down to see what it was and jumped back. Laying on the mossy ground, a pile of bones rattled and moved on their own. Ataro stood terrified into stillness, and the bones grew and elongated. They stood up into the form of a person, and a ghostly orange light seemed to form about them as though it clothed the skeleton in the armor of a warrior. One smoking eye socket stared out at Ataro. He knew this was a yokai, and still could not bring himself to move. I am Gyokutsu. It said in a hissing rasp, then it laughed. <laughs> I got you, Itaro. I've been wrong, and you will make my justice. <laughs> It laughed again, and then a howling wind whipped about in a swirl, kicking up the moss and the sticks on the ground. When it ended, the yokai was gone. 
Itara dropped the bucket he still held and sprinted back to the house. Water forgotten. Itara burst back in through the door and ran up to Tatsuzo. He wrapped his arms about the man's waist, breathing coming in quick patterns of the truly terrified. Itara, what is it? Tatsuzo asked, peeling the young boy off him. There was a yokai at the well. It was made of bones and had ghostly armor, Itara replied. He wiped a tear from the corner of his eyes with his sleeve. Yokai aren't real, Tatsuzo answered. They're just stories, like all the others. But it is real, uncle, Itara cried. It came up out of the well, and it said its name was Kyokotsu. It said it cursed me. Tatsuzo glanced around the room at his assembled audience, while barely containing their laughter at the scene unfolding in front of them. Turning back to Itara, Tatsuzo knelt down and held the boy's shoulders. Listen to me. It's all stories. None of them are real. You've been spending too much time late at night listening to me, I think. Then, looking from Itara to the door and back, added, Where is the water? I sent you to fetch. Itara stirred down at his toes and wrung his hands. I left it at the well. I was too scared. You're getting older. You must learn to keep your head about you, even in the face of fear. Now, go back to the well and bring us the water for our tea. After that, you will go to bed, his uncle responded, shaking one finger at Atara and crooking his eyebrow up. The crowd snickered, and Atara felt his face heat up. He ran from the room to leave the jeers behind him. Atara went back outside, his pulse quickening as soon as the brisk night air touched his face. He chose the other well this time, keeping his eyes on the bucket as it went down and then back up splashing full of water. He poured it into a fresh pail and ran back into the house, making sure not even to glance toward either Yukai Forest or the other well. He delivered the pail to his uncle and left as fast as he could. The Tara laid down in his bed and held his blanket tight to his face, scrunching up his eyes and trying in vain to get the image of the yokai out of his head. He tossed and turned for hours until, out of sheer exhaustion, his body relaxed into sleep. He did not get long to rest, and in the early dark hours of the morning, Atara woke from a nightmare. In it, one of the western monsters, a werewolf, had found him and tore him out of his bed and drug him into the woods. His nose was the first sense to come into sharp focus. Atara could smell the sharp bitterness of burning wood. Then all at once, he heard the growls of a gigantic wolf, as if from far away, and the crackling roar of a building on fire. Atara leapt out of his bed and into the main room of the house. Everything was as it always was, and whatever was burning, it wasn't here. Tatsuzo came into the room a second later, rubbing sleep from his eyes. Where is it? he asked Itara, but the boy only shrugged. The pair moved to the main door and stepped out onto their porch. Only a dim grey of the future dawn led the forest out the back, but rounding the corner of their house a bright orange halo of light almost blinded them. That is Hideji's home, Tetsuzo shouted. Give me the pail and stay here. Itara handed his uncle the water pail and gripped the porch railing as the man took off towards the blade. Memories of his lupine nightmare danced in his mind as the flames licked up the side of the house. Looking closer, Atara spotted two figures in front of the home holding torches and swinging them back and forth, as though warding off some danger worse than the fire. A howl ripped through the night, and heavy footfalls sped off through the darkness into the deep forest. Together with the other nearby families, they got the fire put out. Then, for the rest of the day, Hideji told and retold the story of the wolf that came in the night and walked on two legs. It ripped at their door, and they fought it off with torches, but the monster swung its clawed arm across and knocked one of them into the dry timber. Some people believed him, others thought he was stretching the truth, and others accused Hideji of lying outright. No matter what the rest of the town thought, Itara knew the monster was real. Tetsuzo did not entertain guests that night, 
having worn himself out helping Hideji put out fires all day, and Itaro went to bed early. Unfortunately, once again he did not find sleep until much too late. Then, in his dreams, another monster chased him through the forest. The kami from the Greek mountain sent a mighty ball to Itaro's door to fulfill Kyokotsu's curse. It pulled him from his bed, as the wolf had done in his dreams the night before. The thing flung him into a pyre it had built in the field, butting up against the forest behind the house. Itaro's screams of pain transferred out of the dream and woke him in a cold sweat. The thin sheet he had slept under clung to his body, and Itaro shivered. He couldn't sleep anymore the rest of the night, and when morning finally came, he labored to get out of his bed. The boy had no appetite, and skipped breakfast with his uncle but it was time to repair the fence on the house at the edge of town. The two walked through the muddy streets, Tatsuzo carrying spare planks of wood on a small wheel cart. Atara followed him, holding a bag of tools the pair would use for the job. Atara wished he was old enough to have gone with his father into the fields, far away from the stories and the fire. It would have been longer days and harder work, to be sure, but the yokai wouldn't have cursed him. When the pair arrived at the correct home, Tatsuzo stepped up to the mud-covered door. He banged his palm on it and called inside, but there was no answer, and the door swung loose on its hinge. That was when Itaro noticed the gashes on the walls beside the door, and a tuft of brown fur stuck to a streak of blood high upon the door jamb. Moving inside, Tatsuzo and Itaro found more of the same. There looked to be signs of a fight everywhere in the house. There was lots of broken furniture and blood, but there weren't any bodies. They looked inside and out around the property, but they only found bits of fur and what looked like shards chipped from an animal horn. He didn't find any proof, of course, but Atara just knew in his heart the ball of the Greek tail had taken and killed the family. The boy had no clue how the monsters from the tails were coming to his small town, but he suspected it was because of the Kyokotsu's curse that they wanted to come. They were flying straight from his nightmares, and so Retire decided he wouldn't sleep until he found a way to remove his curse. That evening, the boy curled up on his bed, pulled his knees in and hugged them to his chest. Fear made Atara's pulse skip as he looked out his window towards the forest and the bright moon above it. The clouds moved in a swift current in the sky above, and out of them, Atara spotted a dark, winged figure descending. It was a large black crow, and it landed on the edge of his window. It caught once, and turned one of its eyes to lock its gaze on Atara. The boy skittered back and pulled his sheet tighter to him. The crow caught again, and Atara heard a voice in his mind ring out like a clear bell. Cease your meddling in my realm. It said in a strange accent that Atara had never heard before. The other monsters from the stories and his dreams had never spoken, but they had also never appeared before his waking eyes. I'm not, was all Atara could muster through a quavering voice. The crow opened its mouth, but in his mind, Itaro heard an angry hiss. The realm of nightmares is mine, and I alone am its ruler. I say again to you, see it's your meddling. It isn't me, Itaro pleaded. It's the yokai from the well, the, the Kyokotsu, that's doing it. The crow paused here, as if considering whether Itaro was telling the truth. Eventually, it flapped its wings once, and the great bird left from his window. Just as the boy thought it would not return, the crow landed back onto the edge of his window. The voice pierced his mind once more and Ataro's vision swam. I have spoken with the Kyokotsu. It has agreed to release you from its cars if you bring vengeance on the one who killed it. Ataro stood, stunned. I cannot do that. I'm just a boy, he said. The crow shrieked at him this time, the caw and the hiss overlapping in his mind and forcing him to shut his eyes. Fine, it said finally. I shall kill the one who killed the Kyokotsu, but I warn you, mortal, never again meddle in my realm, 
for I am the Battle Crow and the Nightmare Queen. I am the Morrigan, and I will take your soul into my shadow should you ever attempt to take my power again. It cawed one last time and took flight. This time, Ataro looked out of the window after it, making sure it truly left. Across the field behind the house the bird flew, but on the ground walking toward him, Itoro saw the Kyokotsu in its ghostly armor. I will leave you now, Itoro. My spirit is less vicious now. My victory is assured by the Morrigan. I wish we could have had more time together, but that was taken from us by my murder. God well your soul this night. As the battle crow will take your father's killer to the shadow of the nightmare. Now sleep. With his final words, before Atari even had the time to process what the Kyokotsu Yokai's words meant, the force threw him back into his room, shuttered his window, and he saw only inky blackness. When he awoke the next morning, Itara rushed out of his room to tell his uncle what had happened that night. He came into the main room to find Tatsuzo hanging from a rafter impaled on a wooden spear, straight through his chest, with a single crow feather hanging by a leather strap on the end of the spike. And thus, the story is ended. The tale told, the chapter closed.